Welcome to the EXP Group's discussion of SEMA Paper P2 on performance management. Today we want to uh, cover a few topics uh, in connection with budgeting and management control. We'll start with the concept of responsibility accounting. The idea here is that the accounting system should um, be organized in such a way that costs and revenues are clearly connected with specific business units so that the management in charge of those business units is responsible for uh, achieving uh, revenues and managing the costs that are clearly within their area of control or, or responsibility. Um, if we move on to alternative budgeting models, the candidate should be familiar with the uh, following categories of budgets. Uh, the fixed one is your standard uh, traditional budget set at the beginning of the period and remaining unchanged throughout. Then we have the uh, flexible uh, and flexed budgets. Um, the distinction here, a bit of a subtle distinction, a flexible budget is one which um, allows the uh, budget to be organized according to certain starting assumptions, uh, usually based on actual volume of, of output. So it's sort of the big picture. It's saying, okay, if we're going to produce and sell 100,000 units of a product, here's what the budget will look like. Um, it's the kind of flexible budgets are used um, as part of scenario planning when uh, organizing a budget. For example, when you're in, in the budget construction process, the budgeting period, when the budget is being put together, um, there may be different starting assumptions that either 100,000 units will be uh, produced and sold. Perhaps if it's an extraordinary year and uh, good things happen, uh, the company may wish to know what the budget would or should look like at an activity level of 150,000 units. You can see here that this is, um, th these are two scenarios that can be worked through in order to understand what the implications are uh, if operating at one or the other activity levels. That's, that's flexible budgeting. Now the flexed budget is a kind of flexible budget, but it's done after uh, a period of time has passed where the company says, okay, now we're going to look at the actual level of activity um, and, and adjust the budget, sort of scale it up or down to to what the actuals are. As an example, let's say we start a budget period with 100,000 units as being our uh, expected level of activity. And suppose by the end of the first quarter, the uh, first the uh, number of, <coughs> of uh, sales achieved or, or the activity level is decidedly higher than, than originally budgeted. Now one might want to go back over the first quarter results and make a comparison of uh, budget against actuals but not actually use the original budget but to adjust it, in other words to flex it for the activity level that was actually achieved. So that there is a basis of comparison that becomes relevant and, uh, and of course more meaningful. Now we can take this even uh, we can take this forward to a rolling budget. Let's say at the end of the first quarter in the previous example, we were achieving a higher level of sales. Instead of keeping the budget um, the same for the rest of the year, one can effectively um, adjust it so that the second, third, and fourth quarters will reflect the higher rate of sales being achieved so that one's making an adjustment going forward to the budget and since the first quarter is already behind us, we can add the first quarter of the next year and always keep a 12-month uh, adjusted budget moving in, in front of us. That's the idea of a rolling budget. We have a small example here. Now we go to zero-based budgeting, which is kind of a radical approach to budgeting. It suggests that at the beginning of a new budgetary period, uh, anything that's been approved or, or uh, uh, operated in the past is considered to be um, in the past and therefore any new expenses have to be justified based on 
a completely new set of assumptions. In other words, the zero-based budget is a, uh, if you will, a tabula rasa. It's starting with a fresh uh, or a blank piece of paper and saying, okay, now we're going to build up the budget for the next period from basic principles. We're not going to take anything from, for granted from the previous period. Now, in what cases would a zero-based budget be appropriate? It would be probably uh, useful to have this kind of thinking in an industry which is fast moving, so that last year's business model may in fact not even correspond to the market realities going forward, and therefore one has to uh, budget on a completely fresh set of uh, assumptions, or at least take a fresh view to all uh, past assumptions that are made. Activity-based uh, budgeting uh, is derived from the ABC system of costing, activity-based costing, so that now uh, with an ABC system, assuming the company has an ABC system in place and therefore knows the activities which um, drive costs, so we can call these uh, cost drivers, so it has a sophisticated understanding of the kinds of activities which are generating costs, then the budgeting can be based on looking at those activities and saying, how many times do we need to uh, set up our production runs, for example, because we know the implications in cost terms of having many runs as opposed to fewer or reducing the setup times. It's a more sophisticated way of um, understanding and acting on that understanding of costs and, and therefore uh, managing those costs and budgeting for them, of course. The, the incremental uh, budget is one uh, which m many of us probably have encountered in the past, which involves taking last year's budget and making certain uh, changes to it in order to uh, move forward into the new uh, budgetary period. Um, in a slower moving uh, uh, industry, for example, an incremental budget may be adequate for the purposes of a firm. In other words, there's no need to uh, complicate a budgeting process if a simpler mechanism works just fine. There's a certain expression one has in English that says, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Now, it's important to appreciate the fact that budgetary systems are made by people, they're used by people, and therefore they're going to be influenced by uh, certain behavioral traits of people based on uh, uh, interests and, uh, and possibly even uh, prejudices or preconceived notions that people carry with them with regard to um, uh, businesses. Um, in order to overcome the subjective element in budgeting and to be able to arrive at a, uh, a common budget which serves the company's best interests, we speak of this as goal congruence. In other words, we need to make sure that individual departmental divisional interests are all in line with the overall corporate interests and the interests of shareholders. That's the idea of goal congruence. We also have to keep in mind that budgets, uh, the budgeting process can be motivating for individuals if uh, staff are brought into the process and not having a budget imposed on them, something we also call participation. Budget ta budgetary targets should be challenging, but they should not be impossible. It's really just a matter of psychology and understanding what motivates people. Now, here are just a few examples of problems connected to the use of traditional budgets. One is uh, that they can invite gaming of the system. Now, by this we understand um, the idea that people will behave in accordance with achieving the budget and possibly uh, not more or not go beyond the budget itself. If a budget, for example, has no bonus, um, uh, if there's no bonus program in place to, to uh, reward uh, superior achievement, then we could expect people to 
fulfill the budget, but not more. So if sales are for the year are completed by October or November, one would expect people to start thinking about Christmas shopping instead of working hard through December as well to exceed the budget. Another example of gaming, and there are many examples, would be the uh, department manager, in order to keep his expenses down and within line uh, with the budget, uh, stops uh, investing in people. So he cuts all training expenses, for example. Now, we've seen this during the financial crisis as being a short-term measure, but from a longer-term interest of the firm, to cut back on training and such uh, uh, investments in, in people is not a very good idea at all. There's a short-term gain, but a long-term cost. This is one of the uh, typical problems that can be encountered with uh, budgets. Budgets can be inflexible. We talked about that in the sense of, uh, uh, especially if they are uh, fixed and there's no, um, th there's only, uh, it becomes very difficult bureaucratically to, to alter or adjust them in light of market opportunities. Um, we've already seen the problems uh, in cases where budgets are imposed from above. Um, the connection between a budget and the company's strategy uh, that's also been um, hinted at uh, before. If we think of a budget as being uh, for a shorter period of time, let's say a budget for one year, the goals contained there may not be consistent with a company's overall strategy, which is multi-year in nature. Budgets are also used for many different purposes. They're used to um, control costs. They can be used to uh, reward people. Um, it can be used to to reinforce what we call centralizing tendencies in the company. In other words, to be able to exert control and to limit the uh, delegation of um, authorities within a, 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 a company. So we have to see, we have to recognize that organizational structure and budgeting system have to be very carefully. Um, linked and synchronized and made harmonious, especially in, in search of achieving goal congruence, congruence between the different levels of the company right down to the individual level. Now, there are key metrics in connection with, uh, with, with budgeting processes and measurements of performance. We know the traditional ones here, the profitability, liquidity, and asset turnover ratios. Those are covered in uh, other papers, especially the financial papers of SEMA. Uh, and finally, there is also the um, process of engaging in what-if analysis, which is basically a testing of different scenarios, uh, looking into the future, um, describing perhaps optimistic or pessimistic um, uh, possible outcomes in terms of how the course, how the business will um, is likely to evolve. Um, and the use of spreadsheets, I think, is really quite universal and, and accepted. In fact, it's uh, quite surprising how extensive the use of spreadsheets are in uh, even very large corporations for very important um, processes. Next time, we will discuss um, uh, performance management, uh, measurement through uh, the viewpoint of different models.